welcome everybody. I'm very happy today to be here and uh, have as a host uh, uh, Professor Marc Lazar. Uh, professor Lazar is a professor of political history and sociology at Sciences Po uh, in Paris and is also the director of the Center for History. Um, he has several um, commitments as a historian and also is a president of the advisory board of the School of Government of the Lewis uh, University uh, Guido Carli uh, in Rome. As you probably know, he is one of the most well-known specialists of politics uh, of France, uh, Italy, and also European Union. Uh, he worked on political parties and since uh, the last years uh, works uh, on uh, populism. Uh, he published extensively on this topic and uh, among the, his uh, most recent publications, I just mentioned, um, the book uh, with Mathieu Foulat, European Socialist and the State in the 20th Century and the 21st Century, published uh, by Palgrave, and uh, with the other authors, Le Monde Aujourd'hui, Les Sciences Sociales au Thème de la Covid, uh, by the University uh, of Sciences Po um, the, the last year. So I'm very happy to host you, Professor Lazara, also because I remember you when I was a quite young PhD student as one of my main mentors, and I really appreciate your um, availability to participate in the seminar today. Thanks a lot for this invitation. Uh, just to briefly, briefly introduce, oh. sorry, your, just to mention the, uh, the topic of your um, yes. uh, speech today which will be populism, fascism, authoritarianism, and totalitarianism. So the case of Matteo Salvini would be uh, the core issue of your speech today. Thank you once again for being with us. <laughs> okay, thanks a lot. Uh, maybe if you can uh, share uh, yeah. slides and it will be maybe easier uh, for the different for the audience to follow what I'm going to present. Okay, could you see could you see the slides? Yes, it's perfect. Okay. Thanks a lot. Uh, this is the title uh, of this uh, lecture of this conference. Uh, as you see, I changed of title because uh, I was working and studying this uh, uh, question of populism, fascism, fascism, authoritarianism, totalitarianism, and I decided to take a focus case, a case study which is. Uh, Matteo Salvini, I think that may be because the majority of the audience is Italian, uh, could be interested by uh, this topic. If you uh, uh, give me the next slide, uh, dear Valentine, I'm sorry to ask you that. Uh, we will be, uh, we, uh, we'll be able to introduce really uh, this conference. Uh, as you know, uh, there is a great development uh, uh, of populism all over the world. But uh, you know also maybe that there is a big development of the literature uh, about populism, uh, a huge literature uh, dedicated to this topic in political science, sociology, history, anthropology, philosophy, and so on. And one of the arguments, uh, one of the questions about populism uh, in these last years has been a reflection done not by all the scholars, but a part of them about precisely uh, the relation uh, between populism and fascism and authoritarianism and totalitarianism. Uh, um, the great question is to uh, try to give an answer to this question. Do we see uh, with uh, this development of populism kind of what we could say a comeback of fascism uh, and uh, you know immediately that we have some examples uh, uh, immediately in mind, uh, for instance, uh, in Europe with the Hungarian case, the Polish case, and which surprised me quite a lot, the USA case. Uh, so many books uh, have been uh, published and so many papers uh, uh, when Trump was in power about the Trump administration with so many reflection about the possibility in the heart of the democracy, uh, the US democracy, that there was with Donald Trump a threat uh, on democracy and maybe the possibility of the end and the death of democracies, or for instance, also another topic is about the uh, possibility of emergence 
of illiberal uh, democracy. Uh, if you look, for instance, uh, on this first slide, uh, on some titles, you see some example. It's not an exhaustive bibliography. It's some just some examples. Uh, a book with a, which has a quite a great success of Sherry Berman, uh, Democracy and Dictatorship in Europe, uh, from the ancient regime to the present day. So a very historical perspective. A book in French uh, by some colleagues, uh, uh, which uh, uh, dedicated a very interesting book about the experience of populism in power, populisme au pouvoir. A book uh, by Andrea Mamon, who is a historian uh, uh, who is working uh, in UK about transnational neo-fascism in France and in Italy. Claudio Vercelli uh, published uh, this year, uh, Neo Fascismo in Grigio, and obviously the great successful book by Farid Zakaria, The Future of Freedom, Illiberal Democracy at Home, which means in USA and abroad. Or I, I gave another example of Paul Lenvai, who is a journalist, the very interesting one about Hungary. And if you see as the next slide uh, that we're going to see now, uh, I gave other example, for instance, uh, the book, I think it has been also translated in Italian by Ziblatan Levitsky, How Democracies Die, uh, what history tells us about our future, which is a kind of um, a, a, a reflection coming from the history and arriving in, uh, until our days uh, about the Trump experience. And, uh, uh, and there was also a two other book, um, uh, not a book, Robert Kagan, the famous uh, editorialist columnist of the Washington Post, who published immediately uh, in 18 May 2016 this article, This is How Fascism Comes to America. Madeleine Albright, Fascism, A Warning, which is uh, obviously a very interesting book by Madeleine Albright. And uh, all this reflection about the possibility of fascism in USA, not in Europe, in USA, has been developed at the moment of January 6th uh, at Washington, obviously, uh, when there was this idea about a coup d'etat. I don't know why this French expression has an international success, but it's like that. And uh, if you see the next slide, you will see that uh, uh, different uh, authors, different scholars, uh, have really obsessed by this idea. Federico Finkelstein, uh, who uh, published a very interesting book, From Fascism to Populism in History, um, uh, who is an historian and political scientist. Jensen Stanley, philosopher, How Fascism Works, The Politics of Us and Them, which is a kind of reflection uh, based on Carl Sch Schmitt uh, uh, philosophy. And a recent book by Ruth Ben Gayat, which is an anthropologist, Strong Men, Mussolini to the Prison. So uh, this is uh, uh, an important element. Uh, and precisely because so many uh, books and so many papers, and there are just some examples that are presented in this slide, because you have many other, uh, I would like to discuss this point. I mean, populism, fascism, authoritarianism, totalitarianism are blurry words and notion, except obviously fascism, because fascism corresponds to a certain regime uh, in Italy. And uh, I would like really to propose some clarifications uh, about this notion. So in my first point, uh, uh, mainly uh, will be focused on populism. I would like to clarify this notion. Then in a second part of uh, my lecture, I would like to reflect on the relation uh, ship between populism, fascism, authoritarianism, and totalitarianism. And then I shall take a case study, uh, Matteo Salvini, to try to give him a qualification. So let's go to uh, the next slide, Valentine. I'm sorry to ask you that. And uh, it's uh, about populism and populism at, uh, uh, with an X uh, uh, at the end. As I told you, there is a huge literature, and it's not in the time that I have to uh, do this lecture that I will go further uh, in this uh, reflection about populism. So I'm going to be a little bit schematic uh, in this presentation, but obviously at the moment of the discussion, uh, I could and will have the possibility to precise uh, my reflection. 
to be a little bit schematic, and uh, I would say that when you look at the huge literature on populism, you have two main interpretations. Uh, uh, again, it's schematic. Yeah? Uh, the first one is to explain that populism is a kind of ideology. And the second one is to explain that populism is more or mainly a style uh, with some ingredients of ideology. So let's take uh, these uh, two interpretations. The first one, populism is an ideology. One of the most important scholar about populism uh, is a political scientist, Cass Murd, who has been the first one in this paper in government in opposition, uh, which had been published uh, many years ago. I forgot to indicate the date, but if I remember well, it's around the beginning of the 20, 2000s. And he published this uh, article, The Populist Zeitgeist. And after, he published many other articles and uh, uh, books uh, about uh, this question of populism. And he used to, exp to use, used to uh, use, uh, 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 um, uh, definition of populism as ideology, but to precise a thin ideology. Uh, and that's very interesting because uh, uh, when you are uh, speaking about a thin ideology, well, uh, uh, say, uh, immediately, for instance, for historians, you have a possibility to understand uh, in a long durée uh, the evolution of the ideologies. To be very brief, we could say that at the end of the 18th century, and obviously at the 19th century, you have a big development of the political, the main political ideology. You know them perfectly, conservatism, liberalism, socialism, communism, and so on. And we know that more or less, at least in Europe, around the 1970s and now around the 1980s, it depends on the country, you have a, 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 a decline of this importance of the ideologies. Even uh, in the 90s, you have a development of what you used to call, what we used to call neoliberalism, what in Italian you say liberismo. Uh, it has been a great development of this neoliberalism, but since uh, maybe 12 years or 13 years after the big crisis of 2008, we could say there is also a kind of a decline of this neoliberalism, this liberismo, as you say, uh, in Italy. Populism, uh, if, uh, why this populism uh, without ace and populism at the plural with the ace? Uh, because if you accept the fact there is a kind of populist syndrome, you have immediately to clarify something. The populists are not all the same. Uh, and uh, for instance, you have far right populism in Europe, they are the most numerous. You have regionalist uh, um, um, populist, for instance, in your country, uh, La Lega Nord at the beginning. Uh, you have what I used to call populist beyond left and right. And one of the most uh, interesting experience and case is surely the five star movement uh, in Italy. You have also uh, what I used to call businessmen populist, and you have given to all the world in Italy a very good example. Uh, I, I say that in neutral perspective with Silvio Berlusconi, uh, but we had also Donald Trump in your essay. And this is important to uh, emphasize uh, the differences between these populists. And this is one of the great difference with the journalists, for instance, when they say all these populists are the same. No, they are not the same. Uh, for instance, and we can uh, come back on that, during the, uh, go back to that uh, during the discussion with the audience, uh, but they don't have the same conception of the people. It's not exactly the same. It depends uh, on the populist. So for some populist uh, people are the common people, uh, but for other populists, if the people we are who has a great political consciousness. Uh, this is, for instance, the difference uh, in Italy between the Lega, when the Lega is speaking about people, it's more the common people, la gente. Uh, when the Five Star Movement is speaking about pop people, uh, it's more a popular a people which is educated, which has a quite a high level of politicization. 
Uh, and this is also different with left populism, for instance, in France, uh, with Jean-Luc Mélenchon and La France Insoumise. So they don't have uh, the same conception of the people. Uh, they don't have the same content uh, of the populism uh, about immigration. Uh, the far right populists are against immigrants, against Muslims, against Islam, not with the same argument. We, we can discuss about that uh, after uh, this lecture. Uh, but for instance, uh, the far left populism are not uh, very focused uh, about the immigration. Sometimes they are in favor of the immigration because they have a conception of a people open to the diversity. Uh, they don't have the same sociology. Absolutely not. Uh, they don't have the same forms of organization, but they have, in the same way, some common points, and at least three common points. The first is the sacralization of the people, uh, the canonization of the people. The second one is the hostility again, I said yes, I, I said yes, against uh, uh, the establishment. Uh, uh, and that's a very important point. And the third one, they are all in favor of the national sovereignty. So if we accept that, we have uh, uh, more uh, populist as a style, which means also great pragmatism. I think if we accept this clarification, we can go now to the second part of this lecture. And this is the next slide, uh, which is a, a, a reflection, a theoretical one, but not only, about the relationship between populism, fascism, authoritarianism, and totalitarianism. Uh, I think that to clarify uh, these points, uh, I think we have to distinguish three levels. The first one is a theoretical level. The second one is a level of populist regime. And the third one is a level of parties or parties movements. And uh, I will be back on that. Uh, theoretical level. Uh, we have to start our reflection with an important element. All this neo-populism, by neo-populism, I uh, indicate the populism, the populist of today, contemporary one, have a big change, a real big change in uh, towards the populist of the past, because as you know, populism has a long history, which start at the 19th century. But What's the main difference? The majority, not all, but the majority of the populists of the past were against democracy. They hate the democracy and they wanted to establish a kind of regime of authority and sometimes a clearly an authoritarian regime. The big difference of the argument of the populists of the present time they present themselves as the best defenders of democracy. And they used to say, they are not, they, this is a, the argument they use, we are not afraid of the people because we are the people, not a part of the people. We are the people, we are the good people. We are not afraid of the people. And they say to the traditional parties, you are afraid of the people. You don't want to organize for instance, referendum. We are not afraid by the referendum because we are the expression of the people. We are the people. So that's the reason why they are for the direct democracy, the democracy of the referenda, and they are for the popular sovereignty without limits because they think that the people is completely unified. And that's the reason also why they have great difficulties to accept the institutionalization of the conflict, which is the basis of our liberal and representative democracy. If I give you uh, uh, the reference to the book by Nadia Urbinati, Me the People, How Populism Transforms Democracy. As you know, Nadia Urbinati is a philosopher. Uh, this book is very interesting in my opinion because she explained very clearly why, uh, how the populist now in the present times, in our days, are Democrats, but not liberal. Liberal in the sense of philosophical meaning. And she explains that very uh, clearly in this book. Uh, if you are against uh, a, a populist, 
it's, uh, uh, you are a, an enemy because they explain, and she developed this argument, the populists explain that they embody other people unanimous. If you are against them, it's because you represent specific interest, interest of the establishment, of interest of the foreigners. So the elements who are not inside the people because they are a threat for the purity of the people, and that's mainly for the right populist. That's the reason why, even if they used to present themselves as the, as the best uh, Democrats, they have the potentiality to switch towards authoritarian attitudes. It's a potentiality. It does not mean that they do it. It's a potentiality. So that's in first important element. But on the other hand, they are not totalitarian, which suppose the use of classically terror, violence, control of the media, will of control of the economy and society, and usually uh, an important role given to the state. For the right populists, for instance, they are the majority of, of them are not for a strong state, but they are more on neoliberal position in economy. Not all of them, not all of them. And they don't have, which is the crucial element of the totalitarianism, uh, this, uh, at this will to create a new human being, a new humanity. And that's the reason also why we cannot say, in my opinion, but it's open to the discussion, that they are not fascist. If we accept that fascism in Italy, with Emilio Gentile, Renzo De Felice, and all the scholars who study uh, fascism as a historian, that fascism had uh, a, a, a dimension of totalitarianism, even it's an element which is quite discussed by other historians, obviously, then we cannot say that the populists, even the right ones, uh, are totalitarian. That's the level, the theoretical level. The second level is the level of populist regime. And we have many cases. I'm not specialist on this case, but we can think about Hungary, Poland, Turkey, Brazil, India, Trump administration, and so on. Again, I'm not a specialist of this country. Uh, but this is the goal of the social science to see where is the border between populist in power and authoritarian regimes in the meaning given by Juan Linz, which is a big specialist and the most important specialist of authoritarian and totalitarian regime, which means, I remember you, limited pluralism, but not terror, absence of ID to create a new humanity, limited pluralism, repression, control of the media, but not complete control. And uh, the majority of the scholars now, for instance, who study Hungary, try, and I say, I insist, try to identify if in Hungary, for instance, we are always in a form of a populist regime or an authoritarian one. Where is the border? Huh? Uh, and we don't have clear uh, answer for the moment. We are exactly on the borderline. It's not my speciality, but I would like now to stress a third point, which is the level of parties or populist movement. What does it mean? Uh, I would like, uh, I think this is important to study populist parties, not in power, but before the access to power. Populist movements, it's obviously uh, an allusion to the distinction between fascist movements and fascist regimes. And I think this is uh, uh, very interesting to study, at least interesting for me, to see uh, how the populists uh, in opposition, before accessing to power, uh, used to uh, do some practice, uh, used to do politics to determine, to have the possibility to say, are they always populist or are they authoritarian or maybe are they fascist? And the best example to take is obviously Matteo Salvini and this is my third part. And this is the next slide. 
Thank you. So, uh, three points. First, some elements about Matteo Salvini leadership of the Lega from 2013 to the present times. Uh, as you know, uh, Salvini has been nominated as secretary of his party, which was an, an 2013 Lega Nord, and decided to change the orientation of the Northern League to create what we used to call a national league. And this national league, which is a personalized league, league of uh, Matteo Salvini, uh, was uh, characterized by the hostility uh, to political class, to the establishment, a valorization of the people, an hostility to European Union, hostility to migrants, to Muslims, to Islam, but not anymore as it was at the beginning with the Northern League, uh, hostility against Roma ladrone, uh, thieving Rome, and against uh, uh, Italian of the South, the so-called Terroni. I'm sorry to use this uh, uh, word, but it was the expression used by the Northern League. As you know, uh, um, this change of strategy had a very big success. Uh, in 2018, 17% of the vote. Uh, in 2013, it was 4% at the national level for the Northern League. And 2019, at the European election, it was an enormous triumph with 34.3 uh, at the European uh, election. And all the polls, uh, all the meetings, uh, all the visits by Matteo Salvini on the different cities in Italy uh, demonstrate a high popularity of the leader. As you know, because the majority of you are Italians, uh, 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 Matteo Salvini failed in 2019 when he tried to obtain the dissolutions of the chambers. And Salvini now is at opposition. And we know perfectly, because we see all the polls, there is a decline of his popularity and also the popularity of the league, even if the Lega remains the first part. And the first part. When we focus on Salvini, I think we can say, and this is a big complexity of the characterization of these kind of movements and leaders of populist movements and leaders. And that's the reason why, in my opinion, it's very difficult just to characterize with the ideological dimension. It's more style again. If you see uh, and if you uh, analyze uh, the different feature of Salvini, you have different faces, if I may say, different elements. Sometimes it can be a, a real far-right leader, and I will be back on that. But it can be at the same moment, and I don't speak about the new position of Salvini with Draghi's government, but even before, when, uh, uh, for instance, uh, after 2018, and when he was in power as minister, he can be a responsible uh, politician, for instance, uh, he has been in favor of the tunnel between Lyon and Turin uh, because it takes in account uh, the, his electoral basis of the north of the country with so many uh, small business businessmen and shopkeepers who need for the economic development of this part of Italy uh, to have this connection between France and Italy. It can be a very conservative leader and I give you a very topic example. Uh, this is uh, his conception of the nation and the people, of the Italian people. And when you see his definition, it's an ethno-cultural definition of nation and people. For him to be Italian, you need to have Italian relatives. So it's for the droit du sang, blood law, versus ground rights. And you have to be Catholic. We know that in his personal life, he's not a very good Christian, but uh, uh, he used to demonstrate his own face uh, 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 to thank uh, in permanence the Madonna after an electoral success. He used to kiss the crucifix and to grow a rosary. Uh, this is interesting point, uh, because if we do a comparison, for instance, with Orban, it's exactly the same conception of Hungarian nation and people. But it's not the conception of nation and people of Marine Le Pen, for instance. 
she is not on this conception. For Marine Le Pen, now she presents herself as the best defender of the Republic, the French Republic, and the laicity. And she does not say that you have to be French because you have to be Catholic. She's absolutely not in this position, which is, was the classical far right position of his uh, own father, for instance. She's not on the same position. So different features, uh, conservative one, uh, uh, responsible politician would take in account uh, the necessity of the economy and especially of the basis of the uh, northern electorate and voters uh, of the Lega. But does Salvini is a fascist? That's a, a, a very uh, complicated uh, question. Uh, we have some common points, absolutely. I give you some uh, example. In June 2018, uh, um, uh, it has been a moment of crisis uh, between Giuseppe Conte, who presented his government to the president of the Republic, Sergio Mattarella. And Mattarella, using the Article 92 of the Constitution, refused the composition of the government. Maybe you remember of this moment, because one of the ministers proposed by Giuseppe Conte was Paolo Savona. And the president of your republic say it's absolutely impossible because it will be a change of our uh, international treaty. And I don't want that because we know perfectly that Paola Savona would like to do an Ital exit. So we refuse. And it has been during one week, a big moment of political crisis. And what has been immediately uh, uh, the expression uh, and the reaction more exactly by Salvini is say, we go into Caminare su Roma, la marcia su Roma, to uh, walk on Rome. Obviously, it was uh, uh, um, an allusion of uh, 1922, October 1922. Second element uh, of, uh, let's say like that, common elements between Matteo Salvini and fascist memory uh, for so many uh, Italians. Uh, in, um, in 2019, he published a book uh, in a Casa Pound publisher. And it was obviously a sign to uh, many Italians coming from or used to be at the far right of the political spectrum, and some of them close to neo fascism. Other example uh, the 29 July of 2018. Uh, Matteo Salvini used this famous uh, Mussolini's expression, tanti nemici, tanto uh, honore, so many enemies, so great honor. And uh, he, he uh, pronounced this sentence the 29th July of 2018. And obviously, you know that Mussolini was born on July 29th. So these kind of signs are indication to a certain population uh, who has a memory and maybe a nostalgia of fascism. And obviously, we could say uh, that uh, um, he has a form of xenophobia and sometimes racism, uh, which were present uh, uh, in the fascism, and especially uh, since 1938. So it's many signs, explicit or subliminal, in direction of the far right voters. And we could uh, be interpreted as the fact that Salvini is a fascist. But, but first, it does not use physical violence. Second point, the historical context, obviously, it does not, uh, is very different. There is not this important social, economic, and political crisis uh, after World War I, but it's a banality to say that, obviously. More important, he does not want a strong state in economy. He is more liberal, open to the world economy, but close to the migrants. And this is the interest, obviously, of the Northern voters. He does not want to do an anthropological revolution. And I'm going to present you with the next slide two photo because it seems to me very interesting to do the comparison. 
very interesting this two uh, photo because uh, you see Mussolini uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, Salvini and uh, obviously I think uh, if Salvini used to be like that the uh, summer it's not casual I mean he knows perfectly that it's a memory at least for the oldest Italian ones of Mussolini uh, photography photos but if you see very um, close if you see uh, these two photos you saw, you see immediately the difference. Uh, Mussolini is a super man body. I mean, uh, he is not uh, as the other man. He wants to be uh, a, 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 a strong man uh, and a really a superman. Salvini is not like that. He wants to be a man as the other ones uh, because he has a belly and he does not hide it. I mean, he's not. He has not exactly the same body. Of Mussolini, and it could be, it could seem something very banal, uh, these two photos, but it indicates, I think, a uh, difference which goes uh, further than the, uh, only uh, the photography. I mean, in this, uh, in terms of symbol, uh, it means that there are differences important. I will go to the conclusion with the next slide, and we will have time like that to have the debate. Uh, Salvini is a very interesting case uh, because his offer a real opportunity to reflect on populism. It demonstrates, in my opinion, that it's a style very pragmatic. Now he supports Draghi's government. He says that he is pro-European and he is not hostile to the euro currency. Obviously, uh, we know that it's the expression of internal uh, tension. And uh, uh, Salvini, uh, on the now and the future, could play on two uh, games, if I may say. From one side, present himself as a responsible politician, one of his uh, features I presented. But on the other side, uh, he will remain populist. He will be, as you say in Italy, Partito di lotta e partito di governo in the same moment, party of flights and party of government. And why? Because I think there is a big change, two great changes, two great changes uh, for uh, even three ones. We maybe uh, put the populist uh, for the moment and especially the far right populist in difficulties. The first one has been Trump's defeat in USA. And you know that uh, Salvini supported. Trump until the end, and he did campaign quite uh, in Italy in favor of Trump. And that it has been a, a first important uh, element of change. The second one, obviously, is the COVID-19. And uh, uh, the third one uh, is a recovery uh, fund by European Union. And why it change? It changed because maybe we have to be very cautious on that. Uh, the populist style has not the same efficiency in this period. Defeat by Trump, importance of the COVID and fear of the population, which uh, uh, wants to be protected and wants to have protection and health protection mainly, and recovery front because I think there is a consciousness of a part of the population that uh, uh, to uh, try to get out of this situation you need European Union. And I see when I, I'm looking at the different polls you have, uh, we have in Italy, we see that uh, since uh, the uh, months of uh, June and July, you have a new increase of uh, euro uh, attitude uh, in Italy and less euro skepticism as it was uh, uh, by the past. So I will say that maybe uh, the populist uh, and especially Matteo Salvini is at the crossroad. Uh, it does not mean that populists are finished. Uh, obviously, they can profit of the failure of the vaccination campaign, for instance, and uh, uh, the degradation of the social uh, situation. And uh, uh, they, uh, uh, they will try to profit and to exploit this situation. But I would like to go further uh, on the reflection. Populists are more style, more pragmatic than ideology. They, are, they have a potentiality to go 
in direction of authoritarian attitudes and when they are in power, maybe to go to authoritarian regime, but they are not totalitarian. This is important distinction. But to be back about the relationship between populist and democracy, obviously, uh, what uh, with the Ilvo de Amanti we have argued uh, in the book Popular Croatia, uh, it's a fact that we think that it's a moment where you have the democracy or audience, you have the possibility, you had the possibility, and you have maybe always the possibility to have this uh, new kind of uh, democracy, what we used to call, what we decided to call people crisis, which means an immediate democracy, democracy of emergency, democracy of the leader, and the democracy of the sovereignty of the people without limits, without counter power. But what we see in the publication of the book is also the capacity of the democracy to defend itself and to change maybe the populist themselves. And that's very interesting that that's exactly what you are living in Italy. Usually, political science and the history in Italy insist, underline, emphasize the weakness of your democracy. And I'm very struck by the exact opposite. The fact that this uh, supposed weak democracy is able to absorb the, protest the protestation of populists. Look at two examples to finish. And obviously, this is to the discussion. I opened the discussion with that. Uh, obviously, the populists wanted to change everything when they arrived in power with the government by Lega and uh, uh, Five Star Movement. They wanted to, uh, to, check up, to check up the institution, and they tried to do it. But there is a big capacity of resistance of the institution because of the role of the president of the republic, because uh, of the institution themselves. And what we are uh, looking, what we are seeing now with this populist Five Star Movement is in crisis, with a great part of the Five Star Movement who are inside the institution, we know a kind of process, a kind of process uh, of institutionalization. Look at Di Maio change. Di Maio, before 2018, wanted to go uh, outside Europe. Remember that he uh, decided to come in France to be in favor of the Gilets Jaunes, to express his solidarity. And now he's one of the best defenders of European Union and the friendship between France and Italy. You can say it's opportunism, maybe, but which strikes me is this capacity of absorption of a movement as Five Star Movement. Obviously, you have a part of the Five Star Movement who is against uh, this process of institutionalization. And the other example is precisely the Lega. And surely I did a mistake with Popolocratia, with Silvo. I did not discuss with him of this idea, but we insist too much about the populist dimension of Lega, and we did not see that there was different uh, sensibilities uh, inside the Lega. And for the moment, uh, we know that Salvini had to take in account the other dimension of the Lega, more responsible, more responsible which is very present in your region and in Lombardy, uh, who try uh, to uh, be you know, one part to express a part of opposition to the institution, but on the same way, would want to profit of the institution to be present inside of the institution. So uh, that's the reason why I think it would be a big mistake to say that Salvini is a fascist. This is a real uh, political attitude. We know perfectly that a great part of the left in Italy think that Salvini is a kind of comeback of fascism, is very compared to Mussolini, but I think we have to be as scholars, as social scientists, very cautious, and to try uh, to uh, uh, determine, to, uh, to see the complexity of uh, the case. I think there is a next slide, just to say thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Lazar. I think that you gave a very impressive paper, uh, very interesting, and I, I really, personally, I really enjoyed it. It was really fascinating, so thank you very much. 
uh, well, uh, now we will have uh, half an hour for um, a discussion. So what I ask to the guest is to write their own name on the chat, and then I will allow you to, to ask directly some question to Professor Lazar. Have a minute. Obviously, I have some comments on my own, but I would like to, um, you know, leave the floor first to guest. Oh, so many questions. <laughs> I guess that I, I won't have time for my own. But anyway, <laughs> just leave the floor to the students, which is most important. Uh, first, Leonardo Daziani. Could you please also turn on? You have already yeah. left the camera on. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everybody, and thank you, first of all, for this very interesting seminar. And for me, uh, it has been a great occasion because, in a very personal and humble way, I've been working for our first semester exam this year um, on the opposite point of view because I wrote a paper which title was uh, From Front National to Rassemblement National the multi-faced nature of the national populist right in France. And so my question was um, analyzing the uh, so-called de-diabolisation process uh, by Marine Le Pen. Um, I, I, I've been all very curious uh, to uh, compare it to in some way, the process that Matteo Salvini, as you perfectly explained, has done uh, particularly starting, and we are in the city in which was born the Liga Veneta in Padua. So uh, that's uh, also very interesting politically and geographically. So if, if, it's, if, it's, if in some way um, the diabolization could have been in some way an example for Matteo Salvini in this process from Liga Veneta, Liga Nord, and the figure of uh, Bossi, uh, to uh, the the Lega, so just by erasing the, the word Nord, uh, gaining uh, a, a government position, which is something that probably now uh, Le Pen would like to imitate in some way. Thank you. Uh, um, Mark, what do you prefer? We gather some questions and then you will answer to... L let's say that maybe I'm going to take uh, three questions and we will answer to these three questions. Thank you. Okay, that's fine. Okay, thank you very thank much. You. So, Jorge Terek. Uh, thank you, Ms. Lamelini. Uh, my name is Jorge Terek. First of all, I would like to thank you for this lecture, of course, and for persevering through uh, these difficulties that we have. I believe that you already know that we are uh, attending this lecture, particularly because of that kind of people. So, I'll go back to my question now. Um, uh, you have pointed out the extremes of uh, the right populists and where does it go, for example, in, in, in uh, comparing the, the rules of who can be considered, whether Italian or Hungarian, in terms of their relatives and so on, which is something that Perifle has proposed 1500 years ago, which is totally ridiculous. But the, uh, I think uh, comparing that, you, you have uh, pointed out the strategy of uh, Viktor Orban, on one hand, which is one, much more stricter than uh, Marine Le Pen's, taking into consideration that he is taking his laws uh, much more uh, uh, right than Marine Le Pen in that sense. But uh, what I actually found uh, pretty interesting there is that do you believe that perhaps there is a reason uh, uh, behind the contemporary social political uh, situation in France and on the other hand in Hungary? which actually uh, uh, gives them the possibility to maneuver with what they have during the current circumstances. But that, what I believe is actually that they do have the common goals, but they just cannot ex express them in the same way because of these differences in these two states. So I was just wondering whether uh, you can uh, 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 draw on that something more. Thank you. Thank you, Jordi. And um, last question for this time, uh, Gabriele Bilardinelli. Good evening. I uh, would like, uh, first of all, to thank uh, the professor for the very interesting letter. And uh, my question is about the fact that uh, you have said, talking about the book of uh, Nadia Urbinati, if I'm, if I'm not wrong, that uh, uh, for democracies is important liberalism in the philosophical meaning. 
And I would like to know if also liberalism in the political, ideological meaning can play an important role in the maintenance of uh, democratic institutions. That is, it, it, uh, we can see that democracy and liberalism are essentially connected. Thank you. Thank you, Gabriele. So if anyone else would like to ask questions, just please write your name on the chat and then I leave the floor to Professor Lazar for answering. Okay, thanks a lot for this question. Very interesting. Uh, the comparison, interesting also because there are some elements of comparison between uh, France, Hungary, France, Italy, uh, and uh, a more general question by Gabriele. Leonardo, um, it, it's very complicated. Oh, everything is complicated, as you know. <laughs> uh, but um, uh, at the beginning, in 2013, uh, for Matteo Salvini, Marine Le Pen and the Front National is a good example. Absolutely, surely. And uh, we need to have some research about that because we know in terms of ideolo ideological, uh, let's say, um, different proposition and strategy by Matteo Salvini. Uh, we know also there are some uh, human contacts. And I think that would be a very good topic to do as a research to understand exactly which kind of links uh, between them at the European Parliament, but uh, also face to face, if I may say. Um, we have a very good study which has been done as historian by Pauline Picot, who is a historian, and we did a very interesting research about the relationship between far right in Italy and France, but on the 50s, 60s, and until the 70s. We, we need, in terms of political science, but also history, uh, most recent history, to have this kind of investigation to understand exactly which kind of relationship they have, they have between these two movements. Um, um, I think that uh, um, it, it, it's difficult to, under, to uh, uh, give you a, a, a precise answer to, to your question. Uh, I, I think that it has been a boss movement. Salvini had to take in account uh, the great change uh, of 2019. Uh, you remember perfectly uh, that uh, at the beginning, for instance, in July, before the European Council, we decided to do the recovery fund. He explained that it will be a failure. And after, because of internal tensions, it changed of attitude. Uh, so you remember also that Marine Le Pen as uh, um, Matteo Salvini at the moment of the Brexit, just after the vote, say, we have to do the same thing. They cannot do and they cannot say the same thing now. So it, I would say that it's a kind of convergence parallele, come has said Aldo Moro. And that will be very interesting to reflect on that. Um, uh, just uh, uh, to, to uh, understand uh, the thing, uh, it's true that Marine Le Pen try now to be more moderate uh, uh, in, in perspective of the next presidential election, because she knows she lost uh, during the famous debate, debate with Emmanuel Macron at the second round of the last presidential election, everything because she was absolutely incompetent about the euro currency. And now she tries, uh, she tries really to attract a more moderate electorate. And uh, uh, I don't know if there is a, a relation uh, with the evolution of the strategy of uh, Matteo uh, Salvini for the moment. Um, and. Uh, uh, we have to, to follow that, and it's uh, very interesting. My hypothesis uh, is a sociological one. Uh, you don't have the same sociological structure of the voters uh, between the Lega and especially uh, the Lega classically uh, on the northern of the country uh, with the electorate of Marine Le Pen. The electorate of Marine Le Pen from one side is the south of France, uh, as you know, uh, with a population very uh, xenophobic, linked uh, to uh, the great part of the Pied-Noir, the people who were coming back uh, after the Algeria war. And uh, uh, it's a kind of radicalization of right with a population, retired people, uh, some shopkeepers, uh, uh, let's say middle class uh, electorate, but not so many businessmen. This is a structure of your economy in Italy with so many small business activities. We don't have the same thing in France. And the other part of the electorate of Marine Le Pen is a very a worker class, or which remains of the worker class, and popular, which is on the north and the east of the country. And she tries now to attract more, uh, let's say, dynamic middle class. And she, that's the reason why she, she moderates. But more she moderates, and that will be also the problem for Salvini. More they are more moderate, 
more the open space for contestation on the right. And this is uh, 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 what tries to do Fratelli d'Italia and Giorgia Meloni, uh, being at the opposition to try to attract the people of the uh, Lega who is going be, to be disappointed by the so-called moderation of Savini. Uh, Georgia, uh, this is also a very uh, uh, interesting question. Uh, the, the good relationship, the most excellent relationship of Orban was with Salvini, not with Marine Le Pen. Uh, even if there were some differences with Matteo Salvini. Matteo Salvini, where, when he was in power, wanted to have, uh, for instance, uh, a more, uh, some social measures. Uh, and for instance, Orban was very critical because he was saying that in Italy, you have to do a uh, policy of austerity. Uh, and that was a, a, a difference. But the big relationship was about the definition of nation and people. And this idea that Europe is mainly a, a continent of Christianity and traditional family. And that was uh, the, the, the main aspect of, uh, uh, let's say like that, uh, the, the relation uh, between Orban and, uh, um, and Salvini. Uh, and, and Orban hoped to attract the Lega inside the European Popular Party at the European Parliament until the moment where he decided to get out uh, of the European Popular uh, Party decision he took recently. Uh, with Marine Le Pen, it's uh, different. Uh, as I said, Marine Le Pen does disagree with this conception of nation and people. And you're right, and this is a very good reflection you do, because obviously it's a part of the history uh, of the country, of France country. If you defend as Jean-Marie Le Pen, Marine's father, uh, used to do, uh, we are a, a Christian nation, obviously in France, you have a limited audience. And the intelligence, a real intelligence, she's very clever, is to say now, uh, we are the best defender of the Republic and of the laicity. And she used to explain, even in, the, in the, uh, the speech she does, she explained, I'm a woman, I've divorced, I educated my, uh, my, um, uh, uh, and my son uh, um, uh, with uh, the modernity values. And we, don't, we are against a part of Islam. And now she does nuances. She explained that you have good Muslims and bad Muslims. And uh, she explained uh, if, there is an Islamization of France, it will be a kind of return to the Middle Age. And I don't want that. that this is a, a great change because the far right, usually in France in the 70s, at the moment of the great feminist development, uh, was against that. And now Marine Le Pen presents herself as the best feminist also, uh, at least in the speech, at least uh, in the discourse. So you're right, uh, uh, there are Obviously, uh, when you do comparison, you have to take in account uh, the big uh, uh, elements of uh, uh, differences, uh, national ones. And uh, you're right, they have common goals, uh, but uh, uh, they have to adapt to the reality of the country and always with the necessity to have the most important audience and to attract voters. So for the moment, the, relation between, the relationship between Fides uh, Urban's party and Rassemble Marine Le Pen Rassemblement National are not good ones. And that's the reason in terms of methodology where you have to be very cautious when you are using the expression of the word populist. You have, in my opinion, you have to use it because I think you can give a definition of populism, but you have immediately to uh, uh, underline, to explain the differences, not only between right populist and left populist, for instance, but inside the right populist and inside the left populist. Podemos, it's not exactly the same of La France Insoumise. And uh, uh, Five Star Movement is not uh, La France Insoumise. Even if you can say that in terms of categorization, you may maybe put them in this classification, but after always nuances. Uh, Gabriele, uh, uh, this is Nadia Binati. Uh, interest me, uh, even if I have some critics to the book, but it's not uh, uh, the place to, to do these critics. It's a very interesting book, and uh, uh, this is uh, very uh, uh, interesting what you say. 
uh, because she say uh, she do she does a distinction between neoliberalism and liberalism, and she say that uh, this is a paradox and the contradiction of this populist, of the contemporary populist. Again, they say we are in favor of democracy. For instance, you remember because most of the majority of you are Italian that very often Matteo Salvini say, you you accuse me to be fascist, but I'm not fascist because I want to do voting the people. It was a big speech of 2019 uh, 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 at the moment uh, of the political crisis. And it was a good argument. He said, I'm not a fascist because I respect the popular vote. Uh, but what she say, it's the contradiction which is inside the populism, even left populism, because there is this tension between the idea that you are, you embody as leader, the people, because you think that the people is completely unified. You don't accept that you have different peoples inside a people. And if you think that you unify the people, obviously, even if you say, I respect the democracy, you have the temptation, the attempt at one moment to say, I am the people and you are not the people, so I can suppress you. I mean, I can cancel you. Symbolically for the moment, symbolically, maybe once it could be in terms of violence, physical violence. Uh, and this is uh, uh, the great tension uh, of the populist. And this is a real problem. I just read a very interesting uh, a book which is going to be published in France about La France Insoumise, very interesting, the first research in terms of ethnographic research. And because uh, uh, the scholar did very observation inside uh, the populist movement, but also sociological one. And he, he said exactly the same thing. Jean-Luc Mélenchon, which is a leader of La France Insoumise, left populism, uh, is uh, in permanence with this tension. I am a Democrat but I'm not a liberal. Uh, uh, and this is a real tension, uh, which is not only theoretical, but who has consequences in terms of politics. And that may be the limit of, if I may say, of the Urbani, Urban, or Nadia Urbinati book, because she is a philosopher. So she remains at the level of theory. But as historian and sociologist, I say, okay, this is very interesting for me. But after I have to see exactly what is the concretization of the consequences in terms of politics, which means practice, for instance. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Professor Blazar. Um, I think that we have um, a few minutes again left for other questions. If there is anybody else? Just write on the chat, please. So I'm just asking you uh, a couple of questions, if I may. <laughs> hey, hey. Um, Always a pleasure. <laughs> uh, actually, uh, I, I read the book by um, Urbinati, and I, I agree with you on the point that we have also to consider uh, how democracy transforms populists, because actually we saw already this point uh, uh, in, in a couple of cases, at least, uh, dealing with the Italian uh, scenario. So first of all, the political competition, because uh, actually if we think about the Five Star Movement, uh, when they have to choose uh, an acceptable leader, and um, they found, I mean, uh, uh, the just to use an image as you did, the su suit and tie uh, Luigi Di Maio and not, for example, Alessandro Di Battista, who obviously was uh, less acceptable for a huge part of the Italian population. And the second element, I guess, is uh, being at the government, because actually being at the government means that you have to cope with reality. Things uh, are less uh, easy <laughs> as they thought before. Um, and that's what happened to the Five Star Movements and its significant lack, lack of consensus. So starting from this uh, starting point, so which is uh, the fate of Matteo Salvini now, that is, who is supporting this government, uh, uh, this draggy government? And I wonder if we can draw a historical uh, parallel with what happened to the PCI uh, that joined in the mid 70s uh, with the Governo delle Astensioni and then the Governo uh, della Solidarietà Nazionale. So, I mean, he, he will lose completely the consensus as it happened to the PCI. 
question mark. Uh, second point um, deals with uh, um, uh, Meloni and Fratelli Italia. So I, I really appreciate this um, a theoretical framework that you provided us. Uh, because I think that it was very clear. And I wonder in this uh, theoretical framework, where do you put <laughs> Giorgia Meloni? <laughs> because this is actually the only party left to the opposition now. So that, that would be the, the benchmark to a certain extent in the Italian political parties landscape. Thank you very much. Uh, Valentine, thanks a lot for these two. Well, the first one is not a question. Well, it's a question, but a reflection. And I, 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 I write it immediately because I see the limit of my president bank, who is Ilvo. I don't know if I, Ilvo will agree. No, because in Popolocratia, yeah, we wanted to study how the populists transform democracy. But we have to study also the exact opposite, as you say. I mean, how democracy are. Uh, able uh, democracies are able to transform populist or are not able or are, are not able they are not able in hungary and poland maybe they will be uh, able in france and in italy what is going to succeed for instance if marine le pen wins the next presidential election in 2022 it's not it's, it's a possibility you know we have different polls who indicate that she has a progression of 10 points for the next election and we have two polls of last week who demonstrate, uh, this is a photo of today, uh, it can change in one year, that she's at the 48, 49 points at the second round. So it's not, it, it could be a possibility. So we could imagine, I hope, I must say hope that I will not have to leave that experience. Uh, but uh, what's going to happen if Marine Le Pen wins uh, the presidential election in France, with a fifth republic, we gives all power to the president of republic, and especially with the article 16 of the constitution, we give quite the possibility to establish a dictatorship. So that will be maybe a nightmare, uh, but we are not at this situation for the moment. So yes, uh, you have this tension, and that's the point to study. From one part, popolocratia, the way of transforming democracy by populist, because we know that in the, the populist style now is a, there is a diffusion of this style. Uh, in the book with Ilvo Diamanti, we insist about, we take as example, Matteo Renzi and uh, Emmanuel Macron at the moment of the uh, presidential election, because he presented himself as the best uh, 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 element for the people. He presented us against all the ruling class. He was a member of the ruling class, uh, but he used this style. Maybe, maybe with the COVID-19 and with the recovery fund, maybe there is a kind of limit of this populist style, and especially after the Trump's defeat. Maybe we will have to see that. But we have to reflect exactly on these two elements how populists change a democracy, vulgarity, simplification of the debate, and so on. Also, because we know that there is a role of the social network and the television and so on. But also how or are the democracy are able to change populists or are not able. And I agree absolutely and uh, with you, we have to do the comparison with the Communist Party. You study this Communist Party as I did. So we know perfectly that the French Communist Party and the Italian Communist Party's Party had some common elements and differences. But when they arrive in power, this is a big problem. What do they do? Uh, because when you are in power at the municipal level, at the regional level, at the national level, you have to do compromise. And when you start to do compromise, obviously you lose a part of your voters who are in, let's say like that, in a protest attitude. And this is the big challenge for the Five Star Movement, and it will be maybe the challenge for the, for the League. Uh, now with this experience of Draghi government, maybe with uh, a, a, great, a big tension inside the League. And I think that's the reason why I say that Salvini will have to take uh, the two sensibilities at the same moment. Uh, during some many weeks, he will be very responsible, and other moments, as he did immediately, uh, La sua conversione a loro è irreversibile? No, solo la morte è irreversibile. That's typical, uh, because he tries to remain on this position. And now, again, he tries to put the migrants 
uh, at the center of his political agenda because he understands perfectly that it goes just in the direction of the responsibility is going to lose a part of his voters. So that's the strongness of the institution, even when the institution are weak. And I think also, but this is a point to discuss with you, that you have a specificity in your country, which is uh, uh, because of the weakness of the institution, you have this culture of the mediation. And uh, it's not the case in France, where uh, you, we, we have, uh, because of our history, uh, because uh, uh, of the institution of the Fifth Republic, because of the electoral law, uh, you have always a confrontation very hard between the different political leaders and parties and the very great difficulty to accept the mediation and the compromise. Uh, in Italy, maybe, uh, this is, I, I add that, I put that on the table, maybe also because you have a Catholic tradition, I don't know, that will be to uh, go and reflect on that. So I agree with the first element. The second question, I don't have the answer, and I would like to read something about Georgia Meloni and Fratelli d'Italia. And if I'm not wrong, we don't have a study for the moment, a real study, I mean, by scholars. And I hope that in Padova, you will have a, a, a young scholar that is going to do a research on Fratelli d'Italia. Just like that, impressive and subjective impressions. Uh, I think she, uh, from one part, obviously, She's coming of this uh, uh, family of far right, let's say like that, and the fascist or neo-fascist or post-fascist uh, from one part. Uh, and on the other part, she's a conservative. Uh, for instance, uh, all the importance uh, she, uh, uh, she uh, attributes to the Catholic faith, to the defense of the traditional family, the fact she is a leader now at the European Parliament of the group of the conservative, demonstrate that she has maybe two uh, uh, attitudes. One of authority, which is linked to the traditional uh, far right uh, uh, tradition uh, uh, yeah, in Italy, and on the other part, a more conservative attitude. This question, Valentine, I did the same question to Piero Ignazzi recently uh, in a mail, because Piero Ignazzi, as you know, is one of the best uh, scholar of the far right uh, in the world and in Europe, and especially because he did his PhD on the uh, MSc and he published a lot. And he, had, he, he said, I don't have the answer to this question. Uh, so I'm, I'm in a good company. Uh, Piero Ignazzi is unable to say for the moment how characterize Giorgia Meloni and Fratelli d'Italia. Uh, and that will be very interesting to, uh, to study, not only in terms of political science, but also in a historical perspective, to see the evolution also uh, of uh, uh, this uh, uh, current of neo-fascists. That's the reason why, for instance, I disagree with the book of Andrea Mamone and Finkelstein. They are very interesting book, but they explain what are the theory of them. Uh, Mamon using, uh, uh, working and studying France and Italy. Finkelstein, it's a big survey, a big, um, a big uh, picture about the evolution of populism. And the theory of Finkelstein, very interesting book, is to say that uh, the fascist at the 20, and after World War II decided to change. It's a kind of conscious strategy because it's not possible anymore to present themselves as fascist but they present themselves as populist. And for him, there is a kind of a, a, a strong continuity uh, between the fascist of the 30s and until the World War II and the populist development all over the world after uh, World War II. And the, there are very good chapters about the, uh, the experience of Perón and the uh, populist in Latin America. But the theory, the argument is to say there is a continuity. I disagree with that but it's an important book to read. Thank you very much, Marco. We will keep waiting for the answer to this question then. <laughs> and then we will host also Professor Lazar uh, in our spring school about um, international politics and security in May. So maybe we will uh, have enough time to discuss again in that occasion. So that will be in prison or so like that? No, unfortunately like that, it will be digital. <laughs> But no. hopefully without any, you know, warm <laughs> and, uh, you know, hacker coming into the session. Um, if we can um, 
use other couple of minutes. Georgia adds another question, if you don't mind. Uh, very yes, thank, you, thank, you, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll, I'll try to could, be Could you introduce to... you, Georgia? Could you introduce you? Yes, of course. My name is Georgia Terek. I'm doing my master's at the University of Padova. Uh, Ms. Lomelini is my professor. I'm coming from Serbia, from Belgrade. Thank you. So uh, to try to wrap it up, um, uh, we have been assured that recently, uh, this is, let's say, the flourishing moment uh, for right-wing populists, because they have uh, many topics that they can maneuver with. Uh, their rhetoric uh, uh, relies on migration issues, on economic issues. Uh, now, pretty much, they, they can use this uh, COVID situation and so on. So uh, this is pretty much, we can say, their moment. Uh, if you ask me, uh, I also believe that one of the reasons is actually that there, there was a magnified neoliberal push in the past few decades, which actually caused this rapid rise of populism recently that we see. But uh, besides that, uh, I was wondering, wouldn't then uh, European uh, authorities and uh, uh, the contrasting forces prioritize, especially tackling these issues related to the migration, related to the, uh, uh, any, anything that they can use as their rhetoric to mobilize people on their own. Because it's much easier to instill fear among the people than it is to uh, motivate people and explain what are the real reasons behind this. So th th this is my question. And this is a big question also. Uh, you're perfectly right, and uh, when I say uh, that the populists now maybe, maybe are at the moment of crossroad because of the COVID-19 recovery fund, I immediately precise that I don't say that the populist is finished. Uh, 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 and this is a big debate uh, in this moment, not only between scholars, uh, but with politicians, or obviously politicians are style to populists. We used to say, well, it's finished with populists. Uh, Biden won in USA, the COVID-19 demonstrated the incompetence, the demagogy of the populist, uh, and because of the recovery fund, we will have a marvelous uh, development uh, of the economy and we will resolve all the social problems. Uh, this is a big mistake, uh, in my opinion. This is a big mistake, and it's, it's not the first time. Uh, at the last European election, each time where well, there is a populist development at the European election, uh, the different traditional parties say, okay, but they did not win. So uh, we are always in power. Uh, I think you're right. All these questions, uh, the situation of health, and especially uh, uh, the way of doing the vaccination, and we have to say that it's a big failure of European Union uh, uh, on this point. And look at what's happening in Great Britain, in the United Kingdom, well, the great part of the population has the vaccine. So they use, they will use that. Uh, and especially if there is a new development of the epidemic, of the pandemic. Uh, and, and the second point you, uh, you, you are stressing about the social situation, obviously, if there is a development, uh, an increase of unemployment, the development of the inequalities, despite uh, the use of the recovery fund, it's obviously a good thing. Uh, for the populist. And the third point with migrants and immigrants. And that's the point very important because in all the polls we have, uh, in Italy, in France, but at the Eurobarometer, uh, we see this is a big preoccupation of the majority of the European. For the moment, it's not the first priority because the first priority is the protection for the health. And the second priority is the protection for the work, for the job. But the third one will be always present. And uh, the great drama, in my opinion, is the quite sometimes the incapacity of the so-called traditional parties to give answer to that. You're perfectly right. And uh, I may add something else, always to provoke you and to reflect about. If in one part, the populists are a threat, obviously for democracy, for the reason I indicate, because they, are, they present themselves as Democrat, but they are not liberal. But on the other side, it's a big opportunity to have a great renovation of our democracy. And the drama in Europe with this populist that they embody this capacity of changing our democracy. Uh, this is a, a real point, you know. Is it a threat for democracy or is it an opportunity for democracy, the rise of populists? 
and it's both of them. And uh, the incapacity if, uh, in, in different countries to give answer to the fact that you have a big a kind of uh, uh, a, a great weakness and uh, uh, a, a, a crisis of the classical liberal and representative democracy and the incapacity to give solutions, to give, uh, uh, to renove, to have a renovation of our institution, give the possibility of populists to present themselves as those who have solution. So uh, this is the big issue uh, and the big challenge of the next, not only months, but years. And when I say that in the Italian case, the weakness of the democracy, uh, the so-called weakness of democracy, demonstrates the, also the capacity of absorption, digestion, if I may say, of the populist challenge. But there is a big challenge also for the democracy in Italy is to try to change uh, the liberal and representative democracy, to open more uh, this democracy uh, and uh, to have, uh, for instance, to changing uh, the, uh, the electoral law, but not only to give more capacity of participation to the citizen. And that will be the big challenge also in France in 2022. Okay, I think that we already had a very uh, wide discussion and I'm very pleased that you accepted to join us and uh, to give this very interesting paper. And thank you for also to the guest. Uh, if there is no other question, as I guess that they are about 7 uh, p.m., we can declare con that he's concluded <laughs> this uh, interesting session. Thank you very much, Professor Lazar. And uh, we, we do hope to see you. Hope so. We do hope to see you personally, not uh, in a digital way. <laughs> Thank my you. My greatest once. hope. It's my greatest hope. Definitely. <laughs> Thank you very much, Max. Italy is missing me. <laughs> yeah, de definitely. I mean, Thank you. Bye bye. Arrivederci. Thank you. Grazie. Have a nice professor. Grazie. Bye. bye. Ciao. Bye. Ciao, Mark. Grazie. Grazie a voi. Ciao, ciao Carlo, ciao Marco, grazie ancora. Grazie, grazie professore. Ciao.